Greetings, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to our Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations Program. <clears throat> Today, we learn about the accelerating glacial melts at the two poles. What is causing that acceleration? How the melting occurs? And how that process will affect different areas of the globe? Our guest is Natalia Gomez, Assistant Professor of the, uh, in the uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences at McGill University in Canada. Dr. Gomez is also the Canada Research Chair in Geodynamics of Ice Sheet and Sea Level Interactions. It is a great pleasure to welcome Natalia Gomez and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here. And I would like to start with some a little bit of background here about glacial dynamics in general. You really are an expert on multiple areas of this. Could you please give us a little background about uh, glacial dynamics in general and uh, like how glacials get, get built, how they uh, melt and, and so on and the effect on the planet? Sure, certainly. Um, so, you know, we might think of glaciers, ice sheets, the polar ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica as, you know, big pieces of ice that are static, but actually they're very dynamic systems. They're evolving on all sorts of different timescales um, and interacting with the atmosphere around them and the ocean and the bedrock that they're sitting on as well. So, you know, in general, ice sheets, they gain mass through snowfall from above that accumulates and they flow outwards under their own weight, just like if you imagine piling up a pile of honey, it would spread out under its own weight. Ice sheets do that as well. And then they flow outwards, um, and the, the way that they flow depends on how the ice is deforming in the interior, as well as how it's sliding along the, the bedrock that it's sitting on. And then um, they can end either uh, in, in ocean or on land. And if they're ending in an ocean, then there's, um, they sort of thin enough to be able to float. And then there are these floating tongues of ice called ice shelves. And those can break off um, into icebergs and, um, you know, that go off and, and melt and contribute water to the oceans. Right. So, uh, it's, it's a very long term, I guess, complex process, right? And the, the, in terms of, the, this has a big effect on the earth. Is that correct? On the planet itself? Yeah, so ice sheets can um, both sort of, they contribute meltwater to the oceans, which raises, yeah. uh, changes water levels around the globe, but they also can really impact the climate system overall. So um, one of the ways that they do that is to contribute fresh water to the ocean. And this impacts the way that the ocean circulates, which transports heat around the world. Uh -huh. um, so they can also feed back on how the atmosphere around them. Um, I, I see. Um, and I understand that it, this is the, to study this process, these dynamics is very complicated. Could you please give us an idea of the tools and the methods and the knowledge you need to study these glaciers and these processes? Sure, yeah, it's a very interdisciplinary field. You need to know not only about how the ice works, which is, you know, three kilometers of ice. Ice sheets are very big. The Antarctic <laughs> ice sheet, if you put it on top of North America would actually be, you know, comparable size to North America and three kilometers deep of ice. Um, and so, and they also need to depend on the surroundings. So I'm just gonna share a, a picture. Um, here we go. So this is from a review paper recently that's just showing all of the different kinds of ways that oh we my goodness. study ice. So um, we can measure, you know, from the air, we can measure with satellites that are going um, going across the ice sheet every day, and we can also put instruments in the ocean 
um, or dig cores down into the ice to understand the, the layers that have built up over the past of the ice sheet. Um, and then of course, we can also put instruments on the land nearby to measure how the solid earth is actually responding as, as the ice you know, loses mass, the, the, the yeah. solid earth would rebound or um, gains it would subside. I see. Boy, that is really impressive. There's a lot of technology in this image here from ships, from planes, from satellites, from cores, everything you can practically imagine. So it must be a very good era to be studying this kind of dynamic process, right? And at yeah. just the, the right time, we really need your that expertise and that up-to-date knowledge right now, for sure. Well, I need to ask then, um, can we uh, uh, ask about the actual situation now in which we are having um, a big melt and an accelerating melt? And uh, so we attach this to climate change. Could you tell us about the situation now, the climate change, uh, uh, what shall I say, accelerated melting? Sure, so um, we've been, like you said, we've been observing these ice sheets now using a range of different instruments. Um, and we have many decades now of satellite, um, satellite information tracking how the ice sheets have been responding. And there's, just a very <laughs> unusual behavior of the ice sheets really losing mass in response to uh, climate warming over the last few decades. Um, so one of the ways we can measure that is that there are satellites that go over and measure the mass that's below them. And so they can measure on a regular basis how the ice sheets are losing mass. Um, and so as the climate warms, um, in Greenland, for example, you have uh, a warmer climate in the summer. And so that in that time there's surface melting and runoff uh, and, and the, the sort of amount of mass that it's losing in the summertime due to this surface melting is winning out over the time when it gains mass during the winter. And so you see this steady decline of more ice loss in the summer, less ice gain in the winter um, in Greenland. And you can really see that uh, mass change over the last few decades. In Antarctica, it's actually so cold that there isn't a lot of surface melting. You warm it, but it's still frozen. So the, the Antarctic ice sheet is actually um, much colder than, uh, than in Greenland. There's this ocean current that goes all the way around the Antarctic and sort of cuts it off from warming. And so the surface of the ice, even if you warm it a little bit, it's still going to be mostly frozen. And so it's losing most of its mass through the ice loss across this, the edge of the ice sheet out into these ice uh, shelves in the ocean is, uh, you know, faster than the amount of ice it's gaining from snowfall from above. And um, the situation in Antarctica, especially in these parts that are interacting directly with the ocean, is potentially really unstable in a warming climate. So what that means is if you warm the ice a little bit, um, and the, the edge of the ice sheet retreats a little bit. And if the edge of the ice sheet goes into deeper water, it turns out that the flow of ice across the grounding line at the edge of the ice sheet really is strongly dependent on how deep the water is right at its edge. Uh. And so if it goes into deeper water, then there's more ice loss, more retreat, deeper water, more ice loss, and so on. And so this process could be triggered by a warming climate and then continue on um, on its own into these these marine sectors of the ice sheet. Ah, that's a very interesting point. So this is the, it really is dynamic. It really is complicated. And uh, I, another thing to ask about that in a minute. But uh, is this warming now out of the ordinary? We seem to have still a resistance to believing in climate change in some areas in the United States, and I would like to get your opinion on that. <laughs> Yes, it's absolutely out of the ordinary. Um, we see this in all sorts of records of the Earth system. Um, one of the ways we see this is by tracking actually global sea levels. Um, mm -hmm. These have been 
pretty steady from the end of the last ice age. So the ice, you know, we had ice covering North America and Northern Europe, that all retreated and that ended about 6,000 years ago. And the, the sea levels have been relatively stable, especially over the last few thousand years. And then moving into, we have these satellite records and instruments along the, the coastline that have been there for the 20th century. And we can see this, this clear acceleration in, um, you know, as the industrial revolution develops and, and climate. Yes, um, so it is, the, it, is the, it is the CO2, the rise of the CO2. There's no question in your minds and people that are dealing with the ice phenomena uh, do not have a problem with that. And I believe yes. that there is just huge evidence, as you say, like in the cores and in all of your, you're able to um, uh, look at the uh, thousands, millions of years of, records that the earth has kept so conveniently once you know once you know what those are yes that's so right. an issue where you you mentioned this this just keeps on going even when it starts freezing up again is 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 does that represent any kind of tipping point do you know what it, it, that where we're not able to adjust this yeah so it means that the actions that we take now in terms of um, our greenhouse gas emissions are really sort of locking in a response of the ice sheet in some way, where if you initiate this, this unstable retreat, then um, even if we curb the emissions, there will still be a significant ongoing response of the ice sheet. And so uh -huh. if you look at the, the difference in the response using ice sheet models, we can capture the physics of how the ice sheet responds to climate changes and we can sort of tune these models with all of this sort of wealth of data that we have. And if we consider how that model responds to the higher end warming, you know, more greenhouse gas emissions compared to, um, compared to one in which we act quite soon <laughs> right now to really curb the emissions, uh, the difference in contribution is um, a matter of meters in the coming centuries. It's it's a really dramatic uh, difference between those oh, two scenarios. Okay, and uh, so uh, there really are issues about whether we can put it on pause, so to speak. We we may not be able to reverse the situation, I guess, but uh, we're going to have to deal with a certain level of uh, sea rise and all the other consequences as well. So. Are those consequences, uh, as you understand it now, we tend to, we like to think and say uh, within the next century, but it's not clear that we have that much time, like in terms of, of, of the substantial, uh, uh, significant increase in, say, sea level rise. That's right. So some areas are already really experiencing um, sea level rise and the impacts. And it's not just the average level of the ocean, but if you raise the average by a little bit in a particular location, then you might be um, having storm surges that go over any protection that a coastal area has, or you could increase the height of the highest tide. There are all sorts of feedbacks that take place that mean that um, a small change in the average level could mean a really big impact on yeah, a particular location. Right. Is the sea level rise even from both of those? Do they uh, do melts at the North Pole affect one kind of region or several regions? And that the do you see what I mean at the South Pole? What what do they affect? Yeah, it's actually you know we we might think that the the oceans behave like a bathtub where you melt you know yeah. ice and you fill up the oceans evenly everywhere like yeah. a bathtub, but actually it's really quite a different picture. Um, uh -huh. You can get a greater than average sea level rise in some areas, especially around equatorial regions, Pacific uh -huh. Island. And, um, and actually close to the edge of the ice sheet, you can see a sea level fall. I'm just going to share my yes, screen. Yes, I've heard that. I was so glad you brought that up because that is really counterintuitive you know, <laughs> to us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So let me just share my screen for a moment and I'll yeah. go forward to that. So here is actually the pattern of sea level change you would see around the globe for melting from the top of the Greenland ice sheet on the top 
Okay. And then on the bottom, it's uh, melting from the West Antarctic ice sheet where all of these marine bay sectors are. And so what you see here is in the regions far away from the ice sheet in the reds and oranges, um, there's actually a greater than average sea level rise. And then in these regions in blue, you actually see a sea level fall. Oh and my that goodness. sea level fall is an order of magnitude. So 10 or more times the size of the sea level rise you see far away. So this is something, yeah. It's, um, it's, yeah, so if you think of an example, if you melt a little bit, if you melt enough ice from the West Antarctic to raise sea level on average by one meter, um, along the US East Coast, say, um, so North American East Coast, you might see 1.3 meters of sea level rise. So that's quite a, a big difference in terms of coastal planning. And then at the edge of the Antarctic ice sheet that's melting, sea level might be dropping by 10 meters. So it's, it's, a, bit of a, it's a bit of a counterintuitive problem. <laughs> it really is, it really is. There are, there's three physical effects that are mainly responsible for this pattern. And the first is actually, um, the sort of first order effect is the effect of gravity. So an ice sheet exerts a gravitational attraction on the water around it. And as it melts and its mass reduces, that attraction on the water around it weakens and water sort of goes where gravity tells it to mostly with some complications, but yeah. Um, and so what that means is that as the ice sheet melts, the local sea surface goes down and then further away, you get a greater than expected rise. Um, now wow. the, the other thing that contributes to this drop at the edge of the ice sheet is actually the effect that the earth deforms when you move masses of ice and water around its surface. Yes. And so you remove the, the mass of ice and there's this um, rebound of the solid earth. And so you're bringing up the sea floor and drawing down the sea surface. Um, and the third effect is actually that moving, changing the distribution of mass on the earth's surface has an impact on the earth's rotation axis. So if you imagine the earth as just a spinning top, if you took an ice sheet off of one side of it, the rotation axis would shift towards the missing mass. And this redistributes water around the globe as well. And so these effects all together lead to some areas that experience a much, um, a much faster and larger rise than other parts of the world. And so- This is um, really interesting. That's because we, we just think, for one thing, we think, just it's going to have to be some more water out there but in fact it's very un in a sense it's uneven but there are also these other issues related to gravity that we haven't heard much about so that is a uh, very interesting to to hear about that um then uh can you tell us anything about the time on this, do we is this happening over the next century? Well, obviously it'll happen, but where will we really start feeling the impact? We're already seeing it in terms of like island nations and uh, that sort of thing. We're seeing it along coastlines, but I imagine that will be uneven. But in terms of like people are going to have to get up and evidently move to Antarctica, that might be better, better real estate in the future. <laughs> but uh, can you give us an idea there of, you know, the time? Yeah, so the patterns here, um, uh, I'll just stop sharing my screen so I can see. That's all so right. The patterns, uh, the patterns will emerge right away as the ice melts. So gravity, you know, doesn't wait to respond. <laughs> um, and the solid earth has two different components. It's called viscoelastic. So the initially you can think about it like a, a spring and a piston. And so if you push on this system of a spring and a piston, right away, there'll be an elastic response of the earth. So there'll be an instantaneous rebound in response to the ice loss. And so that pattern emerges right away. Um, and then on much longer time scales, if you wait, the Earth's mantle actually viscously flows to kind of oh, fill wow. in the missing mass. And so we can see, so that means that this pattern evolves as this, even after you stop melting, there's still ongoing flow of the mantle to try to, to fill in the missing mass. We can think about it like um, 
a memory foam mattress with scrapes. Yeah. It's one of those hybrid mattresses. So you have the initial elastic and then the memory foam takes a while to come back. So we actually see that at the, you know, uh, during the last ice age, much of North America was covered by ice. Yes. That all retreated 6,000 years ago, that all ended, but the Hudson Bay and Arctic Canada are still popping up from the last ice age. So the oh. land is emerging from the sea at about a centimeter uh, a year. And so that's, um, that's it's amazing. sort of a time evolving pattern. Yeah, now. right. It takes it takes eons, actually, doesn't it? That those kinds of changes. Um, yeah, sort of thousands. Of them. You would notice them, but we we don't. Um, Dr. Gomez, Gomez, before we leave, that can you tell us? Will there be any effect on, say, these major ocean currents and on ocean chemistry? That do you work with that sort of thing at all? The effects from the glacial melts? Sure, so um, the ocean currents aren't my uh, my area of specialty, but of course it's an interdisciplinary problem and I work with a lot of other scientists right. to yeah. understand the whole picture. Um, but the, the meltwater from ice sheets really does uh, have an effect on ocean circulation. And is that because of the, the cold, the, the, the having the temperature change, that the ice melting ice is cold, <laughs> that therefore cooling? Yeah. What what uh, I, yeah. yeah. If you're I adding um, fresh water, for example, in the North Atlantic, there's this um, overturning circulation yes. where current comes up and it transports heat up and warms yes. to Northern Europe and turns over and goes down. And if you add fresh water, which is lighter, to yeah. this ocean current from melting from Greenland, that can slow down this overturning. Uh, and so that could have a cooling effect. Um, but closer to the ice sheets, so for example, in, in, um, in other parts of the world, you might have a warming effect. And it might result in more variable uh, air temperatures as well. So you can really sort of change not only the ocean, but also the atmosphere um, with, with the effects of the meltwater along with sea levels. Wow, so there, there are a lot of things. Can you project at this moment, say the, in say 25 or 50 years, will there be anything uh, very significantly different from what we have now in terms of this melting the effects, I should say. Yeah, I think we can. So we're already seeing in terms of sea level rise, we're seeing the sea levels accelerate as the ice sheets lose yeah. more mass and that can expect to continue. So that means that the risk of flooding and storm surges um, you know, will, will increase over time. And we can also expect more, uh, more variable sort of patterns of climate. So maybe hotter, hotter, hot times, <laughs> and yes. cooler, cool times or longer yes. um, heat waves, uh, and storms and things. So it will, uh, those effects, you know, are already at play and we can expect for them to intensify in the coming decades and, and definitely in the coming centuries as well. Ah, that's, that is, that's uh, slightly distressing information, but <laughs> that we'd like to hear it from the expert in any case. And uh, we need to know that, and your work is just going to be extremely important here in the next decade or so. You will be a very busy person, I am sure. But I, before we're before we run out of time, I want very much to ask about something else that you are involved in, and that is that you are uh, you you've been selected as one of the forty seven delegates from across Canada for Science Meets Parliament program. Would you please tell us about that? That is sounds like a huge forward step. Yeah, it's a program that's relatively new in Canada where um, the idea is to really foster uh, connections and relationships between members of parliament and, uh, and scientists so that really decisions can be made from the government can be made based on, uh, based on the scientific information. And we as scientists can understand better how our science gets used in yes. the decision-making process. So um, 
I was just accepted to the program uh, recently and, and in the coming year, we will have some trainings and then uh, hopefully in person one day, we'll be able to, uh, pandemic allowing, be able to go and gather for a week in, in Ottawa and really meet with, um, have conversations and, and start to develop those those relationships. Yes. Um, I hate to ask this, but you know that there is huge resistance. In, you have a parliamentary system, for one thing, that makes a difference. But the, the, the American system, right now, we are really polarized. And so there, the group in Congress is just adamantly opposing this, not able to listen to sometimes to scientific fact. And then there are others who are. Do you have that problem in Canada? I think oh, that it, is, the, it is sort of a global <laughs> problem yes. to different degrees. You know, every place yes. has a yes. different sure. um, degree of it. But I, I do think that the more that we can base decisions yes. on um, climate science, which is yes. very well established and we're really, exactly. you know, we have a lot of information and the more we can base um, decisions on that, the more action we will take sooner to be able to mitigate um, right. our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, and, and Dr. Gomez, just all, again on that, that at this, we've thought in this organization, we need an international representation of science to give the input in governments because it is uneven, you know, the acceptance, the understanding of things. And actually scientists do communicate very well, very often, but in a situation as urgent as this or the recent COVID situation, you need that scientific input. Do you see the possibility of a kind of international uh, science input, a group of scientists internationally? Yes, so um, one thing that I, I wanted to say in response to that is that, you know, the earth system doesn't see our, our borders. Yes, exactly. exactly. And, it, and there is um, both in the, the physical effects of climate and also in a more political sense, uh, a lot of inequity in who is causing the, yes. the climate to change and who is experiencing the worst of yes. those changes. Um, so I think we have a responsibility as yes. really humanity to um, to address this problem together. And right. uh, there is actually the International um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the ITCC. Yes. Yeah. Is, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, is, oh, if, yeah, they've been a little on the conservative side. I mean, in, you know, uh, and also they've had to negotiate endlessly with these governments. And you bring up a point that the, in fact, science is borderless at today. I mean, you see this at CERN, at many people are, many scientists work across borders all the time. Science is doesn't need these uh, the village mentality at all. <laughs> so it is terribly important for the scientists to be able to get the information out there um, to the public, but as very much to governments who are, who are making policy now. But I think that your this organization sounds fantastic that in terms of its potential. Did you say it is new? It, it's just... Yes, I believe it's been um, one or two years. This is maybe the second or third year. I yeah. Expect, but it's a relatively new program. And I think the, the response from last year was just really positive, both on the government oh, side great. and on the scientist side. So yes, yes. this kind of thing could go a long way. It's one thing to hear you know, a voice on a screen saying something and it's yes. to really have a one-on-one -on -one exactly. conversation about it. And that's yeah. yes, right. that kind of conversation yeah. can be right. really helpful, I think. Right. I, it, it, uh, it sounds like a wonderful thing. I know you will be a very important voice in this. And uh, it, it's uh, I'm certainly noting all of it here. I will probably get back to you again also on the uh, more depth on the glacier kinds of things because you have so much material there. This was extremely informative. I really appreciate your input. And uh, I wish you all the best in this career. You've 
certainly pick the right moment <laughs> to, to launch a career like this. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, the program is, is just fantastic. I really appreciate it. Oh, uh, that's nice. I'll be back in touch. <laughs> we'll try to do something in more depth. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.